Good morning. I'd like to open with a prayer. Lord, may the truth in what I say strengthen the faith, hope, and love of those who hear it, and may the error fall on deaf ears and be forgiven. I've been asked to offer my thoughts on how we might raise and educate our children to resist the dehumanizing influences of our secular world, as you've seen. I'd like to preface my remarks by saying a few things about the secular world order and the way it shapes our lives, as well as out of respect for the non-Christians in my audience, by saying that I hope my words will give you food for thought and a better understanding of what your Christian neighbors are thinking and feeling. Saint Porphyrius, a Greek monk and priest who died in 1991, stated bluntly that the signal fact of human existence is that not all humans die, but that once conceived and born, their souls, the essence of their selves, and their glorified bodies will live forever. This is what all Christians are expected to believe. Even when it's not apparent in their personal behavior and decision-making, it's what ought to inform their perspective on life, especially life's brief head start on Earth. It's what it means to be human. On the other hand, Francis Crick, the Nobel Prize-winning geneticist who died in 2004, wrote with equal candor that, quote, you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. <clears throat> Who you are is nothing more than a pack of neurons. This is the manifest image of reality that secular scientists and philosophers accept and assume in their work, if not in the way they live or think about their children or view their own moral agency. It's my impression that most humans live their lives without seriously embracing either of these amazing and unsettling claims. It makes us uneasy when we bump up against them, as we occasionally do, especially if we are looking for a good anchorage in the storm of modern life. It's easier just to reef our sails and focus on staying afloat and letting the winds of change blow us where they will. Was Socrates right? Is the unreflective life really not worth living. My impression is that most of my neighbors either wouldn't agree or wouldn't know what he's talking about. They're too busy trying to make a living and paying their bills, looking for love and raising their children, and spending most of their waking hours seeking some form of digital or live entertainment and squeezing as much comfort and enjoyment out of life as possible. Nonetheless, the world we live in has made its choice and has gone with Crick. Any assumption that we are more than a pack of neurons has no basis in science, and our reality comprises only a horizontal axis. There is no vertical, no heaven, no God, no theophanies, just earth, a material realm, realm, and time. Time is the horizon beyond which we cannot see, and the laws governing the material realm in time are the laws that govern everything, including God, if there is such a thing. Underneath all the fine talk about rights and justice and equality, this is the belief of the secular world. And if we accept its materialist presupposition 
and reductionist methods, we must acknowledge that man is merely a machine. He is comprised entirely of material parts, and whatever now is attributed to immaterial sensibilities, his longing for bliss, his search for meaning, his intimations of heaven, his hopes and fears, his moral sense, his hunger for justice and righteousness, his shame and guilt, his beliefs and loves, all of it will eventually find their root causes in matter. There are no mysteries other than those waiting to be solved by science and assigned the right algorithm. Freedom will turn out to be an illusion. Mind will boil down to brain. And religion, nothing more than superstition. Once the root cause is discovered and isolated, it can then be treated and fixed. Eventually, a diagnostic map created, a CRISPR-like solution engineered, and a happy cyborg-like future assured. Until then, we'll have to get along with our imagined selves as reproducing myth-making machines that frequently break down and eventually wear out. Without God and the commanding truths of heaven, man is now free to live beyond good and evil and to write icons of himself without rules or limits other than those imposed by his own imagination. Now this sounds pretty good as though the imagined self were a tabula rasa. However, there are a number of assumptions that come with strings attached and place strict limits on our imagined selves. These selves are, after all, assumed to be autonomous, materialist, atheist, hedonist, and nihilist. Although these terms are seldom, if ever, used, and we may even deny that they apply to us. They are masked by less pointed language, such as empirical, scientific, skeptical, non-dogmatic, non open-minded, realistic, enlightened, rational, unafraid, and free. These assumptions are the new norms of the secular world order proudly declaring themselves to be post-human. They are increasingly assumed by our laws and political institutions, in our cultural entertainments and universities, and in our medical and therapeutic practices. They are taught to our children either implicitly by culture or explicitly by schools. And if we're honest, we'll have to admit choosing some of the descriptive assumptions of the imagined self over the demanding prescriptive norms of someone like St. Porphyrius. So what are these assumptions, our imagined selves, of our imagined selves in a secular post-human age? I'm going to tick them off for you. Matter is all there is, and everything can and will eventually be accounted for in terms of matter. There is no God or sacred order, no heaven, only earth, and no meaning or purpose of life other than what our autonomous, imagined selves create. Cartesian consciousness not God, is the source of being. I think, therefore I am. The body is the beginning and end of life, a piece of matter like a car, driven by the brain that is the source and substance of the mind, the mind that is the creator of the imagined self. 
If the car crashes, the driver dies. Meanwhile, the driver tricks out the car as his feelings and desires dictate. There is no transcendently prescribed rule of life or code of conduct other than what the imagined self, alone or in combination with others, prescribes and enforces. The mind's preeminent role or purpose is the preservation and health, comfort and longevity of the body that it depends upon. Any pain, discomfort, or privation that does not lead to the health and healing of the body is bad and to be avoided. Asceticism is foolishness. The will to power complements and advances every goal of the imagined self. The imagined self, in obedience to Freud, is sexually defined and obsessed. The imagined self, as Freudian scholar Philip Reif argued, is on an inward quest for personal psychological happiness, and the therapist is her guide. And finally, the imagined self finds his meaning by giving expression to his feelings and desires. It is important to understand that these often unspoken and unrecognized beliefs of the imagined self affect more than just the individual. Although it is true that many of the challenges individuals struggle with in the modern world can be attributed to these beliefs, their influences are by no means limited to the well-being of individuals. After all, these are the individuals who are reconstructing our world in the image of their imagined selves. They are rewriting history, re-envisioning education, replacing male and female with multiple genders, redefining art and music as well as language to reflect their critical theories, restructuring institutions as basic as the family and the church, replacing the earth's soil with chemical compounds, re-engineering plants and human bodies, reimagining the future, and in short, reconstructing culture and recreating the world. This is what is meant by the secular world order. Now we can ask ourselves, how can we who don't like this new order raise and educate our children to resist the dehumanizing influences of the secular world and teach them to embrace beliefs that are antithetical to those of our post-Christian, post-human age. This is no mean task and that we are fighting for oxygen in a house that is on fire. Let me repeat that. We are fighting for oxygen in a house that is on fire. As someone who has spent his life in schools and in the company of children and those who teach them, I have a few thoughts on the subject. Please accept them simply as suggestions intended to provoke your thoughts and not necessarily agreement. I will try to state these ideas as succinctly as possible while acknowledging that I'm only scratching the surface of each one. The first is taken from Solzhenitsyn's Harvard and Templeton addresses. As humans, we are created beings in the image and likeness of God. Without God and a vertical access, we cease to be human and are fundamentally treating children as if they are machines that need to be programmed. To resist this dehumanizing trend, the most important thing that we can teach our children is the entire biblical narrative. 
And this ought to be taught as a love story. From creation to incarnation, the exciting and mysterious story of God's wooing of man. As St. John writes in his epistle, there is not much to learn from how we humans love. More perhaps to learn from how we fail to love, rightly. It is God's love for us that teaches us not only what love is, but most important, that we are loved. This is the most important lesson we can teach a child, that he or she is loved by God, that God's love, like all true and honest love, makes demands on us, and that our true and lasting happiness comes from loving him in return. Several years ago, I served as chairman of a school of about 2,000 students in Monterey, Mexico. It was a tradition at this school for teachers to stand outside their classroom doors 15 minutes before the beginning of the school day and greet each child with a hug and tell them how pleased they were to see them. This always struck me as a profoundly human ritual, a theophany, a vision of agape love, a bringing of heaven to earth. At the same time, in my own country, criminal charges can be brought against a teacher for just touching a child. Of course, the purpose of our laws is to prevent inappropriate touching. But what is secular culture teaching children about how humans relate to one another by outlawing touch and suspecting the evil intention of every adult. Second, let me return to my comment about programming. School children these days, as in my own, are shuffled from class to class, and more and more learning seems to be required of them, even as, in my country at least, test scores and literacy rates have steadily declined since 1966. What's going on here? In part, this is what comes from treating humans as machines. Unlike machines, for humans to be human, less is often more. This principle especially applies to money, power, food, fame, and most of the good things we spend our waking hours desiring more of. I come from a large family. There are 14 children being homeschooled on our family farm. They probably average no more than two hours a day of classroom work. The rest of the time they spend working on the farm, playing outside, hunting, fishing, reading for enjoyment, producing the farm newsletter, practicing their musical instruments, writing icons, baking and selling their breads and muffins at the family farm stand, attending the vigils, vespers, matins, and divine liturgies of our church next door, serving at its altar, singing in its choir, and taking care of one another. There's no sight more beautiful to me than these children running across the hayfield on a Wednesday afternoon to get to Vespers without their parents, even though I know their motivation has a lot to do with getting out of evening chores. But most of all, I see the stillness, the quiet, the calm, the silence in their lives, the solitary walks and reads, the daydreaming and contemplative hours that we often shun in schools. In his recent book, Focus, Daniel Gorman presents research indicating that the ability to focus is a more reliable predictor of future success in life than IQ. The research he offers shows that periods of focused stillness improved children's ability to be attentive, to exercise self-control, to understand another person's point of view, 
and to participate with others and show empathy. In a word, to be human. When I shared this research with my sister, who teaches at a top flight private school in Boston, she wrote back to me, quote, I'm happy to report that my classroom is tech free and we regularly practice stillness. Since I started doing this a few years ago, my students' advanced placement scores have increased. This is a very demanding uh, national test in America. Although I never teach to the test, the vast majority of my students achieve fours or better on the national exam. I'm gradually convincing the rest of my department to follow suit. Less is more. Third, one of the most appalling characteristics of the modern school, happy to say I haven't found it here in Estonia, is its ugliness. In my country, these, uh, most schools appear to be designed as if beauty doesn't exist or doesn't matter. They look like prisons with long corridors and windowless rooms with low, flat, gym crack ceilings and fluorescent lighting. But they are cost efficient. Their landscaping consists of acres of pavement, not trees. This reflects, of course, the priority of machines over humans. Orthodox Christians, I trust, will never be found lacking in this regard. Our faith is built on beauty. The beauty of the, of the angel Gabriel's appearing to the Theotokos. The beauty of the angel choirs attending our Savior's humble birth. The beauty of the radiance of the transfiguration. The beauty of the holy and life-giving cross. And the beauty of the God-man's glorious resurrection and victory over death. The entire love story, from creation to incarnation, is what Dostoevsky must have meant when he wrote that beauty will save the world. Children must be surrounded by beauty and taught that beauty is not just an adornment, nor is it whatever our imperfect selves imagine. It is at the core of our humanity, stamped as we are with the image and likeness of God. Father Justin Pop Popovich wrote, quote, education and training is nothing other than the extension of the beauty of holiness, end quote. Every attack on, on beauty, whether by destroying the natural world created by God or by defacing a human attempt to create something beautiful, is inspired by the evil one. Driving here this morning, I couldn't help notice the contrast between the Soviet buildings built here and those that were built before or after. Beauty matters. Like Pontius Pilate who dismissed the idea of truth by rhetorically asking, what is truth? The world will cynically ask, what is beauty? The simple answer is to point to the Holy One. But even the ancients, without the knowledge of Christ, sought him by seeking after beauty on the vertical axis reaching to heaven. Secular man without God, living only on the horizontal axis with utility, efficiency, cost effectiveness, creativity as self-expression, and his theorizing, that usually begins by being against something, knows nothing of beauty. The beauty of our churches stands in stark contrast to these secular values. Fourth, of necessity, schools put children in a man-made environment, two steps removed from the creation and its creator. 
With the urbanization of civilization, children are cut off from nature and be, being silently cut off from God. This alone threatens to begin the dehumanizing process. Our interest in everything around us is conditioned by materialist assumptions. It starts early and is reinforced by our education when they are removed from the natural environment, surrounded by gadgets, ruled by a timepiece, and entertained by a video screen on which they can interact with chatbots. Even the language of children is altered to reflect a man-made world rather than a natural one. Every new edition of the Oxford Junior Dictionary since 2007, I should mention this dictionary appears in every school in America, has replaced more words found in nature, words like heron, ivy, clover, acorn, willow, and many more, with terms taken from the man-made environment, like blog, mp3 player, voicemail, broadband. It should not surprise us that these changes are accompanied by the deletion of Christian terms like monk, nun, saint, disciple, psalm, and christen, words that no longer appear in the dictionary for children. To avoid this dehumanizing influence, schools should surround themselves with the natural environment. And even when this is not possible in an urban setting, the curriculum ought to take students into the natural world regularly so that they can bask in its beauty, soak up its silence, delight in, in its exquisite detailing. This is the world they must feel, may, be made to feel a part of, lest their childhood convince them that the concrete and glass and machinery surrounding them is their fate. Like the children we read about, trapped in their concrete apartment complexes, who think their food comes from metal cans and cellophane wrappers. It seems to me that pedagogy in our schools ought to begin with questions, not facts. This beginning will have the effect of inviting students into the great conversation that is education by respecting the way the dialectical human mind works. The alternative, pushing facts, theories, theorems, accomplishes just the opposite of what it intends by shutting down thought and introducing indoctrination and boredom into the classroom. As a school head all my life, I've observed hundreds of teachers applying their trade. And if there is one general truth I have taken away, it is this. The best teachers are those who ask the best questions. Questions that don't have obvious right and wrong answers. Age-appropriate questions that pique the curiosity of their students whose answers really seem to matter to them. Questions that lead on to ever deeper questions and understanding. Questions that relate knowledge to responsibility. Years ago, I read an interesting op-ed piece in the Washington Post that tried to distinguish a Cambridge education from an Oxford one. The author, no doubt an Oxford man, losing my page here, claimed that both universities taught students to look at every side of a question. But at Oxford, they were expected to choose one. True or not, the distinction is an important one. To be human, truly human, it seems to me, is to live in paradox. As Orthodox Christians, this should not surprise us. We who have embraced the mysteries of our faith, choosing to believe in Christ both as a free act and as an act that is holy from God. Our secular world, on the other hand, perhaps reflecting the conflict between Catholics and Christians in the Western Church over free will, and certainly as a result of its love of rationalism, 
struggles with paradox, and shuns mystery. It either embraces theories that refuse to consider countervailing evidence, or it doubts everything and dismisses the very notion of truth. Finally, this suggests to me that the curriculum should emphasize the great books, telling the human story from the very beginning. Such a statement would not have needed much explanation or defense a generation ago. But times have changed. Not only are these books discredited for usually having been written by dead white men, which I'm soon to be myself, they often assume a knowledge of the Bible and other literature that most modern students lack. Even the, questions, the, even the question of their greatness is in dispute. So my statement probably needs some clarification. In my opinion, a great book must pass three tests. First, is it a book that has been read across time and space in many generations and cultures? Second, does the book speak to the moral order within us as well as the cosmic orderliness around us? And third, does the book present a complete and insightful book of reality in both its horizontal and vertical dimensions, portraying the brokenness and beauty of humans grappling with life between heaven and earth? In my view, the products of our secular age, its books, films, art, and other entertainments often fail the test of greatness by failing to pre present the horizontal in relation to the vertical axis. They present an incomplete and inaccurate picture of reality and of the human situation. Yet these are the books most often and films most often seen by our young people and read by them. Man on an exclusively horizontal plane, man without God, and living outside a moral universe is a machine, living in the metaverse of the imagined secular self. Great books not only shape our view of reality, they also teach us that as humans we are not alone, autonomous, self-created beings. We are part of an ancient, multi-generational, interracial, transnational family whose life experiences are also ours, and whose members have lessons to teach us that can help us live wise, God-pleasing lives. This thought brings me back to my first thought that the greatest of our books is the story of our human family, the Bible, a love story told across many centuries by many humans not unlike ourselves, questioning and flawed, hoping and despairing, loving and hating, trying and failing, seeking while fleeing from God. This is the story we must teach our children. This is their story, the story more than any other that will help them resist the dehumanizing influences of our secular world by teaching them that they can be human only by opening their hearts and being in relationship with others and with God. Thank you. Paradoxes. Marvan, sa nüüd kommentaar, see ei ole küsimus, 
Ma arvan, paradoks tähendab lepemist oma piiratusega tunnistades seda, et tegelikult ma ei tea. Ja siit paradoksi mõttest tuli kuidagi kiiresti edasiarendus selles suunas, et me kõige usklikud teame seda paradoksis elamist. Aga katoliiklased ja luterlased kipuvad vaidlenud teooriate üle ja kas klamerduvad teooriatesse jäävad nagu sellele tasandile unustades siis tõe. See on praegu ebatäpne. Aga ütleme nii, et ma korjasin selle kihi üles. Võt seal tegi mul küsimus. Meid kristlasi on nii vähe tegelikult maailmas üldse. Kuigi arvuliselt võib olla mitte nii vähe, aga siiski. Siin Eestis on seda väga hästi näha, aga vähe meid on. Et tegelikult me ei või tea neid katoliiklasi ja luterlasi nii hästi. Nii nagu katoliiklased või luterlased ei pruugi teada nii hästi neid õige usklikke. Aga selmet, et me tõmbame piire, peaksime me väga otsima praeguses maailmas ühisosa. Ja kui me sellele siiski keskenduksime kristlastena rohkem, siis võib olla, me võiksime olla tugevamad. Heitäh! Thank you for the comment. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I'm a, I was not born an Orthodox Christian. My father was an evangelical pastor who had a large family. And he and my mother were probably always be the most saintly people I'll ever know. Uh, so I think there's a, a great deal to be said for our recognizing our commonality in Christ, whatever religious group we belong to. Uh, I, think, uh, I think the West, the Western Church, can learn a great deal from Orthodoxy. Also, I became Orthodox believing that. But I also think the Orthodox can learn a lot from the Western Church, and frankly, from what has caused the Western Church to decline so rapidly. Uh, that is the future that the Eastern Church also faces if it doesn't address problems of the secular culture, particularly with its children. And uh, I agree with the speaker. If it doesn't see that we as Christians have a lot more in common with one another than we do with the secular post-human world. Kas on veel küsimusi? Teine pool. Aitäh, Ragiks, väga huvitava ettekonde eest. Mind huvitab selline asi, olen Jaak, et USA ühiskond on, no ütleme, kuski võibolla 300 aastat vana, võibolla natuke rohkem. Ja oli meeldi kuulda, et te olete väga suurest perekonnast. Mind huvitab see, et laste kasvatamisel, kui suurt tähelepanu pööratakse juurtele, Eestis on lakse juurte suhtes üsnagi, noh, neid peetakse oluliseks. Iga ameeriklane on algi juurte poolest kuskilt planeelilt otsast pärit ja kas laste kasvatamisel räägitakse lastele ka nende juurtest, olgu see siis kärgpere või olgu see siis traditsiooniline pere. Aitäh teile! Uh, that's, that's an interesting question to ask an American. Uh, there's a division of, uh, throughout my lifetime, there's been a division of opinion about this. Uh, there is the uh, more recent view that America needs to stress individual identity, individual roots, multiculturalism, uh, America traditionally did not stress that. When an Estonian immigrated to America, they were expected to learn English and become an American. And being an American, of course, has to do with living in America, but it also has to do with buying into the 
very explicit values that were set out in our Constitution uh, over two, as you say, 250 years ago. Uh, I think that debate still rages. I can see advantages to both sides. Uh, but the sad truth is, is while that debate is going on on a theoretical level, American families are falling apart. Every year, more and more children are being raised by single parents. More and more children are being born out of wedlock, which means they really don't have a family structure. Families move around a great deal. Uh, as you heard in my talk, my family has made a commitment to stay in place, to do work on the farm. Uh, they earn their incomes by, they're, they're brilliant carpenters. They make furniture, they do other things. They teach their own children. Uh, that, is the, that is the decision they have made. But when you speak of roots as Americans, I have to tell you and be honest, you know, I'll tell you a funny story. My wife gave me a DNA test several years ago. And uh, my father's always been English and my mother is Scottish. She's a Fraser. And we always thought that, that was our, those were our roots. That was our ancestry. When we got the DNA results back, it turns out I'm 80% Scandinavian. I don't know a single Scandinavian relative in my ancestry. And I suspect that, uh, by the way, I talked to your students yesterday. I was talking to them about the Emperor Marcus Aurelius and his famous notebook. And uh, I, I made the point that Marcus Aurelius wrote his notebook while fighting the German tribes on the Danube and in what is sort of modern day Hungary as well. And I said those German tribes were there because the Goths were forcing them south. And I asked them, where did the Goths live? No one knew. They're your ancestors. They lived here in the Baltic states. Now, they're not your only ancestors because they kind of moved through with other waves of immigrants. To speak of our ancestors, um, I, I, I made a joke with them. I said, it's funny that a man who raises cows in Montana has to come here and tell you what your roots are, that the Goths once lived here. But for our country, I, I think that's a, we have to be Americans and we have to be more like America. And we have a lot of people who would like to be more like Europe. We have a lot of people who want to get into their own individual ghettos and enclaves and be Irish or African American or Jewish or whatever. That's not what America was about. It is what Europe is about. I love Europe and I love the distinctions in Europe and I want Europeans to be more like Europeans. But I don't want us to become like Europe. I, I, I love the world as a diverse place. So that's, I'm sorry for the long-winded answer, but that's how I feel about it. I, th I, I must have answered all the questions with my talk. I, 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 I tried to. Oh, no, I have one more question. I have one more question. And uh, I do appreciate its absolutely amazing presentation. Thank you for that. Uh, I do love your notion of uh, love, of beauty, of nature and nature environment as, say, as a cure, as a medicine. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, what we as a teachers can do in order to help uh, children to be more immunized? Because one beautiful day, children will be out of school, out of this environment what we are creating, and they will be back in a toxic world, right? So what we can do today in order to help children to be more immunized against this toxic world? Another speaker at this conference who, who uh, I'm referring to uh, the professor from Sacramento, Sasha, uh, who I think makes a, really answers your question the way I would, and that is that as a teacher, the best thing you can do is come into a relationship with your ch students and model the kind of behaviors and loves that you want to see in them. Uh, you have a profound influence on them. 
as, as you who are parents have a profound influence on them. And if, if you make the effort to celebrate beauty in your home, you know, and it's a simple thing, you know, listening to beautiful music, taking them and showing them beautiful art. You know, you, I, I laugh with my friends. I don't walk into the MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in, uh, in New York, and say to the, uh, the guide, uh, I want to see something beautiful. They look at me like I was crazy. They're showing art that is very modern. I like some of it because it expresses the, what I've been trying to say about the post-human secular age. It's a beautiful expression of it. But it's not beautiful. And in fact, the very notion of beauty is kind of risible, laughable to most modern artists. That's not where I am. And that's not human. So uh, I think they're going to be looking at you to model great stuff. Let me give you one. The teacher who had the most profound influence on me, I was sent off to a boys' school when I was 11 years old, 12 years old. I had a teacher who was just a wonderful man. I loved him so much that after games in the afternoon, after we played football or whatever, I would go to the library for an hour before a seated meal just to be with him. And he would read poetry to me. We would read a lot of Joseph Conrad together. He was an amazing teacher and mentor of mine. And he introduced me to poetry. And uh, one of his favorite sayings is, any poem worth reading once should be read three times. We wouldn't talk about a poem until, until I had read it three times. Uh, but he, didn't, he wouldn't have said it in this way, but he was introducing me to beauty. And uh, those poems, now that I'm an old man, they just keep... I remember poetry that I haven't remembered in 30 years. Let me, uh, sorry, but let me tell you one other story about my family. We had a large family. Every morning at breakfast, we ate our three meals. Every morning at breakfast, my father gave, each of, uh, gave us all, actually, the same Bible verse. We had to memorize it that day, and we couldn't eat dinner that night until we could perfectly recite the Bible verse. And we'd come into dinner, we'd recite our verse. He'd always choose one of us to do it. And then we could eat our evening meal. Now that sounds really insane in the modern world. I agree. I agree. But on the other hand, it gave a kind of structure to our lives which was beautiful. And uh, it also helped me with my memory, which I'm now losing in old age. So um, I think the relationship you have with your students, you know, loving them, that's why I made the point about touching. I'm, I'm not a very touchy, feely guy, but it appalls me to see what's happening in our schools. And, and the Mexican example, the Mexico is such a beautiful country, and, and the way they treat their children, the way they treat their pupils, it's just beautiful. But that's a culture that allows it. Thank you. Thank you very much, David.